welcome to Science View, where we cover the latest advances in Japanese science and technology. I'm your navigator, Tomoko Kimura, and this week's Science Watcher is Dr. John Gathright from Chugu University. Hello, I'm glad to be here with you today. Here is today's lineup. Today on The Leading Edge, we'll explore the sense of touch. It's a highly developed sense that makes it possible for an experienced craftsman to detect a surface deformation that's just one micrometer. Studies have also revealed new things about our fingertips. Join us as we explore an amazing sense that's the result of millions of years of evolution. And on J Innovators, Michelle? We'll be introducing a Takumi who is revolutionizing the way factory wastewater is treated. He developed a sewage processing system that uses ozone and hydrodynamics. The technology successfully decreases the large amounts of sludge that result from the processing of industrial waste, which in turn leads to lower waste disposal costs and less damage to our environment. Stay with us to find out more about the Takumi's invention. But first, today's Science News Watch. Dr. Gathright, what caught your attention recently? Well, I was very interested in the news that a panel of experts met for the first time in May to discuss whether Japan should host the International Linear Collider or not. Using unprecedented technology, the International Linear Collider would be a 30-kilometer long facility used to research how the universe came about by colliding particles together. A group of university professors and scientists held a meeting to discuss the pros and cons of constructing the ILC in Japan. In future sessions, they will consider different issues, such as the cost and personnel needed for its construction and upkeep, and what scientific benefits it will have. The panel is expected to compile a report on the ILC's benefits and agendas by March 2016. Should it become a reality, the ILC could answer our questions about how the universe came into existence. But will Japan be the host country for this cutting-edge facility? That is yet to be seen. I look forward to any new news updates on the project. And now for the leading edge. Today's topic is human touch. We touch many things with our hands in the course of a day. Yes, it's an integral part of our everyday lives. When you see something that is beautiful or interesting, it's natural to want to touch and hold it because touch allows us to gather a lot of information about the object. We interviewed a person who has an incredible sense of touch. Take a look. This is Ota Ward, Tokyo. There are many small factories in this area. Most operate on a small scale, but there are craftsmen here with exceptional skills. We visited one such craftsman. I'm Yasu. This is the expert with an incredible sense of touch. His name is Hidemi Komiya, and he works at a metalwork factory. He creates metal molds for a variety of products. He's a professional with 40 years of experience under his belt. He's particularly skilled at surface polishing, and his work is first rate. When we visited him, he was in the process of making a die cast that will be used to make plastic wrap. He is using sandpaper with diamond powder to polish the inside of the cylinder to a mirror-like finish. He gauges the smoothness with his own finger. If I feel even the slightest hint of a snag, then it's no good. It has to be completely smooth. He allows no compromise and polishes it till it's completely smooth. Yasu asks to touch the cylinder. Wow, it's so smooth. It feels like the surface of a mirror. When she peers into the cylinder, you can see her eye reflected on the inside. The thin cylinder had been polished to a mirror-like sheen. His polishing precision is more than one micrometer. We had Komiya show us the true extent of his ability. 
He brought out a sheet of metal. Yasu examined it first. Wow, it's very smooth. It felt as smooth as glass to Yasu. But when Komiya examined the metal sheet, uh, it has a nice shine to it, but it's not completely smooth. What? It still feels rough to you? Yes, quite a bit actually. It felt perfect to me. Was it actually still rough? We had the sheet examined with a laser microscope. Here are the results. Sure enough, the surface had an unevenness of 0.5 micrometers. Komiya's fingertips were sensitive enough to detect it. It's incredible that he can feel a 0.5 micrometer difference. It is. The limit to what the sense of touch can detect is believed to be 0.1 micrometers. It's rare, but there are skilled people like Komiya who can tell the difference at that level. While it may not be at the same level as Komiya, our fingers can perceive the texture of bumps of fine objects. How does it work? Under the skin are touch receptors and they're responsible for identifying the differences in what we touch. Please take a look at this. It's a cross-section view of the skin, which allows us to feel things. These are the touch receptors. The areas of the skin that have hair are slightly different from the hairless areas. This is a hairless part. For example, your fingertip. The touch receptors are spread out in the skin and the subcutaneous tissues underneath it. First, we have the Meisner's corpuscles. They respond to smooth and rough sensations. The touch receptors that are located in the creases of the epidermis are called Merkel's discs. They respond to grainy bumps. Then we have the Ruffini endings inside the subcutaneous tissues. They respond to horizontal tension. The receptors that cross over between the dermis and subcutaneous tissues are Pacinian corpuscles. They are extremely sensitive and respond to the slightest stimuli such as when a mosquito lands on your skin. So even though the Pacinian corpuscles are at the very back, they're very sensitive. I didn't know that there were four different types of touch receptors. Exactly. These receptors gather information about the object and relay it to the brain. Only then do we become aware of it. Did you know that a large part of the brain is used to process information from the hands and fingertips? Take a look at this. This is called Penfield's homunculus. It looks like some kind of a strange monster. What is it? Well, the illustration shows how much of the cerebrum's somatosensory area is used to process information from a particular body part. Well, I can see that the hands and mouth are huge. Exactly. It shows that our hands and mouth gather so much information that it takes a good chunk of the somatosensory area to process it. I see. So I guess this shows that the sensations we feel with our hands are very important. That's right. One of the defining traits that sets us apart from the apes is the ability to walk on two feet and use our hands freely. By using our hands, we acquired new skills and our brains developed as a result. There's an extraordinary connection between the hands and the brain. But what is the difference between people like Komiya who have a heightened sense of touch and ordinary people like us? Well, this next video will explain it. Let's find out. I visited Kale University to learn how it was possible for Komiya to feel such a minimal amount of abrasiveness. Nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Seichiro Katsura is studying how to translate human sensations into digital data. He showed us a device that he invented. Inside the black box is a coil. The stick contains a magnet, which converts any pressure changes detected into electrical signals. A board is placed on top. The device will record any movement that occurs when a finger brushes against a surface deformation. This is because the board vibrates whenever a finger bumps into an obstruction. 
Our finger feels the vibration and the machine records it. A metal sheet that Komiya polished was placed on the device and Yasu ran her finger over it. For her, the board felt incredibly smooth and she wasn't able to feel any bumps. The analyzed data was displayed as a graph. These are the vibrations that occurred when Yasu ran her finger across the metal sheet. The horizontal line is the time and the vertical lines are the vibrations. The lower the vertical line drops, the faster the vibration was. This is Yasu's starting point and ending point. As you can see, the board barely vibrated. Next, it was Komiya's turn. That's good. How was it? Uh, it's still a bit rough. It's not completely smooth. What does the analysis show? This is Komiya's graph, and this is the part that he touched. The board was constantly vibrating. It's completely different from my graph. The difference between the two graphs is immediately obvious. Compared to Komiya's graph, Yasu's graph shows that the board hardly moved at all. She wasn't able to feel any bumps due to the lack of vibration. Meanwhile, Komiya's graph shows a wide range of vibrations, both slow and fast. He was able to feel the slightest bumps because he knew how to expertly vibrate the board. Katsura explained that the difference was in how they moved their fingers. Komiya had the right amount of pressure and speed. He knows the balance between the two. Believe he moves his finger in a way that allows him to detect surface deformations. So the movement of his finger was what helps him feel the subtle differences in the texture. Yes, vibrations are crucial to the sense of touch. There are four main tactile receptors and each one responds to a different frequency. This is the diagram you saw earlier. The Meisner corpuscles and the Merkel's discs respond to frequencies that are around 100 hertz. The Pacinian corpuscles underneath respond to anything between 50 hertz and 500 hertz. It's very sensitive. If you look at Komiya's graph, you'll see that there are a lot of vertical lines. Does that mean he's able to catch a wide range of frequencies? Yes. Komiya knew which motions would bring him the most tactile information. The four receptors work together to provide your fingertips with precise information. But there's something else on your finger that plays an important part in the sense of touch. Can you guess what it is? Something on my finger. The nails? Well, let's see if you're right. Its close connection to the sense of touch is being revealed. It's found on chimpanzees, humans, and other animals that are skilled at using their hands. The answer is fingerprints. Until recently, it was believed that fingerprints developed so that we could grip things better and live in trees. However, Takashi Maeno of Keio University questioned whether this was really its only purpose. He found it hard to believe that the touch receptor's position in relation to the fingertip's ridges was a coincidence. This is a cross-section view of a finger. These protrusions are fingerprints, and these are the fingerprint ridges. What's interesting is that there are two rows of Meisner corpuscles for every ridge. Another interesting point is that there are Merkel's discs hanging in the valley between two ridges. As the cross-section diagram shows, there are two Meisner corpuscles under each ridge. shown in the upper part are the fingerprint ridges.
A hypothetical board is placed on top of it. The changing colors indicate which areas are receiving the most pressure. Certain parts turned red when the board was pushed sideways. The pressure is magnified by the fingerprints and is concentrated in these areas. Maino discovered that the fingerprints served to relay pressure to the Meccano receptors. The Meissner corpuscles are here, and the Merkel's discs are here. The fingerprint ridges accurately communicate the pressure to the Meissner corpuscles and the Merkel discs. Fingerprints magnified the pressure felt by the fingertips and communicated it to the mechanical receptors. Once thought to be solely for enhancing our grip, we've learned that it also enhances our tactile sensitivity. This means that it's responsible for our ability to differentiate between rough and smooth surfaces, handle different objects, perform complex tasks, handle complicated actions. By having fingerprints, we gain the ability to perform intricate movements that require intelligence. Well, I was wrong. Well, you're close. I never imagined that fingerprints played such a big part in our sense of touch. They do. The pattern of the fingerprint isn't important. What is important are the fingerprint ridges. We're finding that the pressure is also communicated to the proscenium corpuscles, which are deeper than the Meissner corpuscles, and the Merkel's discs. Because of their location, Pacinian corpuscles were originally thought to be pressure sensors, but we're learning that they are extremely sensitive and detect the changes in pressure levels. So far, we've learned that the sense of touch is very functional and precise, and we're constantly learning more about it. Here's our next report. Touch is also used for physical affection between family members and friends. To learn more about it, Yamada visited Oberlin University. Hajime Yamaguchi is studying the effects that physical affection has on the heart. He asked Yamada to tell him which physical touch felt best to him. Yamaguchi brought out a velvet object and stroked Yamada's cheek with it. He says that the speed of the stroke affects how it feels. He tries one speed. This is the second speed. Now, the last one. Ah, that's it. The second one felt the best. I see. The first one went by too fast. I wanted it to move slower. The last one was too slow to the point of being ticklish. The speed of the first stroke was about 50 centimeters per second. The second stroke was about five centimeters per second. The last stroke was very slow and was about 0.5 centimeters per second. The speed that felt the best to Yamada was 5 centimeters per second. Hair-bearing skin has a fiber called C-fiber. It receives the most stimulation when something moves across it at a speed of 5 centimeters per second and communicates it to the brain. This produces a pleasurable feeling. So I guess we're pre-programmed to enjoy it. Obviously, I knew that he would feel a difference in the speed, mm. but I didn't know that there was an ideal speed. Can you tell us more about this? Of course. Most sensations are instantaneously communicated to the brain by a thick fiber called A-beta fiber. C fibers, on the other hand, are thinner and are slower at conducting information to the brain. And the information isn't sent to the cerebrum's somatosensory area. It goes to another part that handles emotions, such as pleasure and discomfort. 
I wonder why it goes to the part that handles emotion. The sense of touch is important for mammals, and especially humans. In recent years, a wave of studies suggests that touch is truly fundamental to human communication, bonding, and health. Physical contact is very important for our social lives, so that's probably why we developed sea fibers in the first place. I'm Michelle. The Takumi Renovator we're going to meet today is in Obihiro City, Hokkaido. His technology is said to have the potential to extend the service life of waste disposal and treatment facilities in the most innovative way. Let's go and see how that's done. I visited a factory of a well-known confectionery company in Japan. Here they make very sweets using red beans, flour, and butter. Hello, I'm Michelle Yamamoto. Nice to meet you. I'm Shitara. This is our Takumi, Moriyoshi Shitara. This is a confectionery factory, isn't it? What does your innovation have to do with this place? Let me show you. Come this way. The Takumi took me inside. This is the waste treatment facility where the factory's wastewater is treated. This company produces one to two tons of wastewater every day. The wastewater contains organic matter such as oil and fat, and conventional waste disposal methods inevitably produce sludge. But by using the Takumi's technology, they were able to reduce the sludge and factory waste to one-tenth of the original amount. We went to see the technology in action. Whoa! The water is swirling around so fast! Can you tell me what's happening in there? The wastewater you saw earlier is being mixed with ozone to cause a reaction. By incorporating the Takumi's technology, the factory now has almost no polluted sludge. Let's see what happens when you mix wastewater with ozone. He used this demonstration machine to show us how the system works. Could you show us how it's done? Certainly. He put some food coloring inside the water. In this case, the food coloring represents the organic matter that is found in wastewater. Wow, it's so red. The red water will become transparent as soon as the ozone is added. Transparent? Really? Yes, just wait and see. The ozone was added, and just 10 seconds later, the color is getting lighter. Well, it takes no time at all. What exactly does the ozone do? Ozone is made up of one oxygen atom and one oxygen molecule, and is a powerful oxidizing agent. It has the ability to break down the large molecules of organic matter into smaller particles. The Takumi invented this technology as a way to solve the doubts that he had about conventional wastewater disposal and treatment facilities, which produced sludge and other industrial waste. I just couldn't accept sludge as an inevitable part of the water purifying process. To find a way to purify water without producing large amounts of sludge. It was constantly on my mind. The conventional method for treating wastewater is as follows. All solid substances are removed and microorganisms are used to break down the organic matter in the water. However, substances that cannot be broken down remain as sludge. The Takumi came up with the idea of inserting his ozone treatment tank before the microorganism treatment process. The ozone would break down the organic matter, making it easier for the microorganisms to process the waste and effectively reduce the amount of polluted sludge. 
the Kumi was able to reduce the amount of polluted sludge even further by incorporating a CERN technology. He used hydromechanics to enhance the ozone reaction. The carefully controlled amount and strength of the ozone that is blown in causes the outer edges to become agitated and causes a swirl to form on the water surface. Meanwhile, another swirl forms at the bottom of the tank, but this one rotates in the opposite direction as the surface swirls. The two swirls effectively mix the ozone and the organic matter together without using a propeller. It took him six years of joint research with the university to develop this technology. But wastewater from each factory has different components. The Takumi aims to create a system that can be used anywhere. I hope that one day people will say, ozone technology that doesn't produce sludge is the norm now. But did you know that back in the day, they used to produce large amounts of waste to purify water? That's my wish. The Takumi's invention has currently been used at 80 facilities throughout Japan and has been yielding good results. He has recently begun receiving inquiries from overseas as well. Reducing the amount of sludge means less waste and less of a negative impact on the environment, so I think it's a significant achievement. What do you think? Well, in Japan we'll run out of waste disposal sites within the next few decades. The big question is, what will we do once that happens? It seems our only option is to completely revolutionize the waste industry. The Takumi's technology may be an answer to this dilemma. I look forward to seeing how it will be used in the future. Thank you very much, Michelle. So Dr. Gethright, can you give us some closing thoughts on today's topic? Sure. I think we often take our ability to touch and feel for granted. Our bodies are equipped with very high-tech sensors leading to tremendous brain activity and information. Research shows that we tend to touch things and other humans less as we grow older. I now have a renewed appreciation for touching and have decided to reverse this trend and touch and feel more. It might even make me feel younger. That's all for Science View. See you next time.